I want people to know people who are survivors, but also otherwise. I want to be vulnerable enough, open, honest enough for people to know that the truths about what this is like so that other people who struggle can, you know, can, can know they're not alone. We're here today with Tanya Culver Humphrey, who has a pretty big story to tell. And we've been talking about, honestly, what it means to tell a story of your weight, how much trauma you've endured, and what it's meant for your life. And we really believe that part of healing is being able for you to tell your story and to tell the truth. So why don't you tell us who you are and tell us about your life and your childhood. Okay, well, um, I'm a mom. I have two kids, two teenage kids. <laughs> it feels like I have a lot more because there's so many more over <laughs> at my house all the time. Um, I'm married. I live in Portland. Been here a long time, but I grew up um, all around United States. We moved a lot when I was a kid. My dad um, was Ellsworth Culver, who was the co-founder of Mercy Corps. Um, he also uh, was helped to found and was the vice president of World Vision and Food for the Hungry and a lot of other nonprofits. He was a pretty powerful man, huh? Yeah, yeah. He was. People. He was a diplomatic a diplomat. He worked to do diplomacy with people and humanitarian work came from a missionary family that was really big and um he was just doing all of that type of work people like, looked so. up to him yes people thought he was an incredible man yes he was very charismatic um went out and did a lot of things he would uh, was able to open up a lot of different programs in different countries and places where other people couldn't um that's really important to me, I guess. I think about who he was because I didn't ever want to be anything like him. But um, maybe that gets further down along in my story. But yeah, he was he was a uh, had a lot of power, a lot of charisma, very well connected, and um, yeah, very public. Yeah. So then, why don't you tell us about your childhood growing up with this man? The 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 meaty part of the story and what's just come out part. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So <clears throat> recently the Oregonian spent 10 months with you for journalists, right? Mm -hmm. Working day in and day out to tell your story. Yeah. Um, that's probably a good place to start for me that, that I felt I've always wanted to speak. I've always wanted to, to stop hiding of, um, and feel free to be all of who I was, but because of um, because of the things that happened to me, boy, it's hard to start talking about these things sometimes. Because of the things that happened to me, I had hidden all of that, and it made it very difficult for me to to talk to other people, to to share myself, to do any of that. But I was really trying hard to. Be forthcoming. Yeah. Honest. Yeah. I wanted to be, I wanted to not hide anymore. And I also really have always felt like I wanted to, to, to do something to help with, with all of this. And what all of this is, is, uh, you know, sexual assault and um, institutional responsibility for those kinds of things. So the, the, uh, I spent 10 months with the Oregonian telling about how my father sexually abused me, um, took pornographic photos as well, um, from the time when I was in preschool through high school. Um, it was 
uh, there were a lot of different people who knew, um, teachers who I had told, camp counselors, other people, but because of his position, I am sure that influenced it, um, why people didn't report and nobody did anything to help me. There were lights along the way of people who did believe me and did some things. And there were, I shouldn't say people didn't report because there were two reports to, to Child Protective Services. But, but for the most part, the rest of the people didn't report. And nothing was done when it was reported to Child Protective Services? Nothing was done. They didn't talk to me. They didn't talk to anybody. It was pretty much, they will say they don't know what happened. I mean, I did interview them, and it's part of the film in the documentary that, that came out. There was this, the Oregonian put it out a very long article in a 40 minute documentary and um, they did an amazing job. And part of doing that was um, me, call, I called DHS and asked them about what happened because I have the re records right there, but they can't answer. They said, we don't know. They said, we don't know because we don't have it written down. But. I mean, I know that they didn't do anything because I was there and didn't experience them ever talking to me. So mm -hmm. I know that. Um, so what did it feel like to work with those reporters for 10 months? Was that hard for you? <laughs> that was like going through fire. It was a extremely difficult. Um, I, I keep comparing it to boot camp. It was like emotional, um, physical, uh, spiritual boot camp. I had yeah. to, to, to face like every single one of my fears and insecurities like every day without having any chance to have a break. And it was, <clears throat> I have to say that they did an amazing job. They did it with full integrity and diligence and compassion. There's no way to take away the fact that it was going to just be hard. It just is the nature of journalism yeah. because they were getting at the truth and finding the truth and trying to tell my story, which was ugly and full of all kinds of cover up and all kinds of terrible things that they had to be, you know, we had, we, it's, it's how it is. You have to, you have to answer those questions. You have to go through, I mean, there were, over 80 hours of just being um, filmed, talking about the abuse that I experienced as part of the documentary, and that was just that piece. So 80 hours of film talking about the abuse that you experienced. Yes. Yeah. And not only that, part of the story is also that, that uh, Mercy Corps was notified and found out. And it's, it's, it's hard. We talked about this at the beginning, how to tell the story because it's super, super long and complex. And, you know, there's all these pieces to it. And so I come into it going, okay, what are the important parts? But, yeah, there's so many parts. There's so many parts. Yeah. parts. But um, this is a pretty important part, you know, that they, they covered it up. They did um, an investigation but it was always done by his friends and colleagues then they had plenty of evidence and I retained a lot of that. I kept it, saved those documents of the things that they were given, um, things, uh, reports from, from counselors, the DHS records, medical reports. I have been hospitalized three times and it is mentioned in those three hospitalizations. I talked about being abused from the point when I was in ninth grade on have I gave them those they even yeah there's a, a lot that they had a lot that they had and they didn't do anything they didn't even suspend him during the time of the investigation he was totally protected by his friends and colleagues they just covered it all up for him and you were 21 years old yeah when this yeah when that investigation yeah happened. and I was in college and had to go and hide because I felt fearful I was really afraid of him I was afraid of him knowing where I was, it was in my family. Uh, my family had, oh, no, people didn't believe me from the beginning, or if they did believe me, it's not true. It's not true that they didn't believe me. I'll actually, 
some did. It, it just didn't matter enough for anybody to do anything. So that's really the honest truth. It didn't matter enough. Yeah. There were, there were people, one of the teachers that I told completely understood what I was talking about, talked about her own abuse to me, didn't do anything about it. So yeah. where does that land with you on a daily basis that I don't matter enough? Talk about something that you probably can't ever get out of your head. Um, that I think <laughs> that was probably one of the biggest, um, obstacles, one of the biggest things. Cause I, I fought when I was a teenager, I fought over and over. I mean, I told so many people the list, list is actually ridiculously long. I mean, it's really long. The amount of people, grown-ups, professionals who knew, including my doctor. I mean, it's it's just it's just unfathomable, really. Um, and I kept fighting. I kept trying. I was so tenacious, but I just kept getting squashed down. And and there's only so much a person can like really, really take, you know, Ugh, without internalizing some yeah, part of that. Yeah, you do. Belief. And I think, actually, I think even if I hadn't been saying all of that, just being treated that way, being abused, being raped, he raped me, he sodomized me, it was, it was brutal. Um, and this was not one time? No, multiple times. I can't even count. Um, I can't even count. Along, it, on trips, at home. Even in the story came out that it was with, you know, one of my friends, he was, he was a predator. Um, that alone, that teaches you that you don't matter. I mean, you don't have to yeah. even tell somebody and have them ignore you to think you don't matter because you're treated yeah. like you don't matter, like you're an yeah. object. Yeah. So to be treated like you're an object repeatedly from the time when you're really little and then to have everyone around you act as if you're not speaking or it doesn't matter what you're saying, then yeah, that was, I felt like I didn't matter. And like, and also like, is it okay for me to talk? Even when we're, even when we're talking here today, I mentioned, how do I think what's, I can talk about this. I want to talk about this. I'm determined to talk about this. I'm yeah. like, absolutely like grateful that I get to talk about this, but still it's hard for me to get to the jumping off point where I know, okay, no, it's okay. I can do this. Like the, I have permission. There was a question of what can I talk about? Yeah. What's okay. <laughs> yeah. What's what okay. Can people hear what's going to be too bad, too hard for people to hear. Right. Yeah. And it's your life and it's your story and telling it is healing for you and other people who've been in your situation. And the truth is, you're an adult and you can talk about anything you want, right? And you shouldn't have to edit that for other people's experiences. Yeah. But that's not your experience. It's not, but I'm learning that. I'm really grateful for that. I hope that what I'm going through can help other people know that because... Yes. I, I want to be honest about how I f feel and how I felt and how hard it is to come through. Because that feeling like I matter and that I'm allowed to speak and that I'm not just behind soundproof glass and people don't listen. And even if I feel like I'm behind soundproof glass and people aren't listening, that I still can speak and I can still break the glass. Like that other people can do that too. That is That would yes. be the most redeeming thing out of all of this. Yeah. Because... I've had so many messages from people. I can't hundreds. I can't even count about people who are, who are watching this story, who saw the documentary and, and have watched all the news articles following it. And they hear just like I heard the message from other people not listening to me. They receive those messages of what's coming to me now as if it's coming to them. And that is so powerful. Like it's to, to, to say, for me to say that I matter now and I know that I do and I'm determined to embrace it. 
I hope it will, I hope it will help other people recognize that they matter too. It doesn't matter who you are. People from around the country, from around the world. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. 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 And I get on a bit of a soapbox about it because I think, because it's like, I, 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 I'm so passionate about that. It feels so, I feel so, maybe it's because it came from so much of not feeling like I mattered. And the tenacity and the fight to and, get where you are now. Yeah. And showing people that to be brave and to stand up and tell your story as hard as it is, is so powerful for yourself and part of your healing journey and other people's healing journey. Yeah. And I think I would... I would also say that part of that comes down to being allowed to make your choice for yourself, what's important and who you are and what works for you, because it might not work for everybody else to, to tell people, but you should feel, I would hope people would feel that they are absolutely allowed to, that they can decide. Mm. Maybe it gives them the courage. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, hearing other people- Here, watching other people tell their stories gave me courage. Yeah. And if it would give somebody else courage, if that's what they want and need. And I hope, and I think we all need to talk about it, whether or not we talk about it publicly or talk about it with somebody that that cares about us. I think talking about it is really important. It's really, really healing. I don't think people heal all. I think we're made to be relational. Yes. And to have all these demons in your closets and people not believing you for so long and having this abuse be a part of your life for so many years and having to still go to school and act like everything's fine when nothing was ever fine for you. Yeah. It was so, so hard. (laughs) It's so hard. (sighs) I mean, I don't think anybody can imagine what have you been feeling since you've been telling the story publicly through the Oregonian? Have you, you've done some other things publicly. What is it? What has that been feeling like as you're going through that process? You mentioned boot camp with the Oregonian, but I know this process is a, is an evolution. It is. It's still an evolution. I think like at first I had to get over, am I even allowed to speak? I mean, right. literally I had, I had, I had to be told that I could speak yeah. over and over again. Such an ingrained limiting belief. Yeah. Am I even just allowed to speak? Just speak it. Just speak it. And I told myself over and over, just speak the truth. That was my only, like my mantra to say the truth, tell the truth. I shouldn't be ashamed of the truth. And if people are going to watch me, I want them to not be ashamed of the truth. <gasps> you know, but then what do I do? I feel shame anyway, you know, so, <laughs> so, oh crap, you know, here I am. I'm not gonna, but, but then talking about it anyway, just, it's like, you know, you stick it out in the light and the, it's, isn't that the Wizard of Oz when the sound like something, in that or Less something scary. like that, like, you know, just shrivels away or something like that. And there's, there's that. I mean, that's why it was boot camp. It was like forcing me to just, I'm sh- feel total shame or, you know, talking about certain things that happened to me that were really awful and really graphic or, or just like demeaning, um, including with my friends, you know, having my friends be hurt. It's terrible. It felt so bad. But, and now I'm comforting all of my friends to tell them that they don't have to feel guilt. So many people feel guilt when it's like the, the, the perpetrator's that need to feel guilt and the people, the bystanders who didn't do anything, they are responsible. They don't need to feel guilt. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit, like comforting other people. You know, this is your story, but you have had to comfort other people along the way, right? You've had to make other people say, no, it's, it's okay. Even though nothing's okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's been a really interesting thing that's been happening that I didn't ever expect. I mean, going into all of this, I didn't expect anything, actually. I didn't expect any of what happened. I didn't expect anything. I just, you know, I just went for it. You mean but starting to tell? Starting to tell. When I went to the people. Oregonian, okay. I did it because I was afraid and I, I felt threatened because I had gone to, the, to Mercy Corps and 
they were doing, the, they were covering up again. And you went to Mercy Corps a year ago. A year ago. Actually, right now is the anniversary time of when I went to them. And I For think the second time. The second time. Yeah. And they were shutting it down. Again. Again. And I gave them documents basically proving that I knew that they had done the wrong thing. And I felt extremely exposed and vulnerable. And that the only way for me to not be... To, to be safe is to let it get in the light. So for safety's sake, but also for my own self, just to being like a whole person. But, um, so, so, so in the beginning, I didn't even, I just, you know, do it. But then along the way, I just, it ended up more people. Like I, I, I would start with my friends because I didn't expect to be having them be interviewed and have to talk about all of that. You know, I just went in there like, Oregonian help. I mean, it was so scary. It was so scary going in there the first day. I just, I could hardly talk. And if you see the video at the beginning, I couldn't even say my name. I could not say my name out loud to that film. Now I can say it, but I couldn't say my name. That was just, it was so hard. But then I'm talking to my friends and I realized that they're all, I, they're, it's a combination. You asked, like, how does it feel to comfort other people? There's two bits of it, I think. There's there's this... No, well, there's more than two bits to it. Um, there's a part of it that in having to speak to my friends, especially my friends from high school who feel guilty, who witnessed things, um, either had it happen to them by my father or witnessed it or I or was told and they didn't know what to do, that they feel guilty now and they cannot shake that still. But to be able to tell them helps me actually also too, because if I'm sitting there telling them they aren't guilty, like then I, I mean, I have to, in a way I'm talking to myself. Sometimes I didn't believe it. Sometimes I told them and I still didn't believe it. I comforted them and I didn't believe it. It, it is hard to do that sometimes, but and comforting the journalists, you know, you telling they were a little bit traumatized by your story. Yeah, they they never asked for that me to comfort them, but I felt like I, I often felt the need. Like <laughs> I was so hard. It was which so, we do feel the need. Yeah, yeah. We as humans, we do feel that need when something is hard. Yeah, we feel the need to comfort. It's hard to talk about really hard things to, to sit there. I mean, there were times when I would go for three hours or four hours and talking about really terrible things and they'd have to look at them and it's traumatizing. It just is. And I, and I would feel that's that, can I speak? But I would feel like, have I hurt somebody else by talking feel about responsible? Yeah. Did I hurt them? Did I hurt? And I think probably a lot of survivors and people just in general feel that way. Did, by me sharing my pain, did I just hurt somebody else? Yes. But we should That's be able... That's so valid. Yeah. We should be able to share our pain It's and receive other people's pain, but we aren't responsible for it, you know? But we can... And when you can feel that way, you can feel good to, to be interacting with each other. Yeah. So oh, that's because so you, can, true. you can just hold the space, but you don't so have to true. take on their guilt or take on anything else. It's just supportive. It's very rich. I mean, Tanya, that's so profound and something that I, I think we are, as people, we struggle to understand that, that I can be in pain and you can be in pain and we can be interacting, but I don't have to be responsible necessarily for that pain. We can just be in it or both be experiencing different things together and that's okay. Yeah. I mean, when you said that, I was like, oh, that's so true. I think it's like, I think we forget how powerful we are. <laughs> we totally don't know how powerful we are. Oh, uh, yeah. Like in every What we're capable of, of, what we can endure. Yeah, but how powerful we are to each other. Like what are, I mean, I'm thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Like what, when you're with another person that we don't have to have answers. We don't have to, we don't have to have answers. We don't have to, uh, fix it, fix it, any of that, but just the power of being present with somebody else in the middle of pain is like 
extremely powerful and extremely healing, you know, and people, I think people expect that they have to do something or be better or be, or no answers or all of that stuff. But for me, most, the most helpful of, you know, my friends and people who have been supporting me, I've been people who've just been willing to, to be with me, to sit with me and to, to, to just be, hold the space, hold the space, not judge, just, you know, care, even say, I don't know what to do. I mean, that's a valid say. I really answer. don't. I don't know what yeah. to do. I I love you, and I don't know what to do. I'm just here, and I'm like, and I always say it's okay. You don't have to know what to do. I'm trying to reach you. You don't have to know. You're what to comforting do. them. You know what I mean? Like, it's, yeah. And <laughs> but it's it's so it's so yeah. That's how I know. Like, like so people worry about it so much. We worry about it so much. I don't know how to. I don't know what to do. Yeah. Well, you said some of your neighbors haven't talk to you or said anything to you, which is so interesting, right? People don't necessarily know how to address it. They don't know how to address you. They don't know what to say. They're, maybe they know how horrific your story was, but what do they do while you're taking out the trash? You I know? think it's, what I found is people are really in pain watching the story. Yeah. They're in pain and they know it's painful they're feeling pain. And they don't know how to... What to do with it. They don't know what to do with it. Make t- How to make time for it or make space for it. I really appreciated one of my neighbors this week who, who hadn't said anything to me. And it's very awkward because I see them, but I didn't say anything. And I was like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, I don't know. I didn't like ring it up. But, but he was helping me with my car and I could see... It was so awkward, but I thought this is great because he's facing, he's facing the awkwardness and he's saying, and he's stepping out of that and just saying something. I'm like, that's great. You know, like nobody knows what to do. Just the fact that they didn't say anything up to this point. I'm not mad. I just recognize that it's awkward and everybody, no, people don't know how to handle it. And I have to, I I felt like, well, he ended up just saying, you know, I just wanted you to know, I, I, I saw it and you know, he was choking up. I just. You know, you couldn't even have all the oh. words. I'm like, thank you. God, it means I a can... lot. Thanks for helping me with my car. And, you know, but that was like that alone is yeah, just. Yeah, that's a moment. Know, it was. It was a really. It even was really though he walked in the door and was probably like, oh, I flubbed that up. You're like, <laughs> yeah. thank you for acknowledging and me trying and not being scared of me. Yeah. Because I've been vulnerable and told my story. Yeah, you just need to try. Yeah. I just need to try, really. That's all that, because that just shows I care about you. And that's all people want and need. Not all. I mean, we need a lot of things. But yeah, <laughs> that's one of the no, things. It's, it's really important it's to know really that important. we matter and yes. you've spoken, especially with this stuff that you've spoken and it's been received. Yeah, you know, yeah. you've spoken and I like with this, that my voice has gone out and it's been heard. Because I always felt like it was never heard and it never mattered. So to see how it matters. And people always go back to this. And I, and, you know, you may be thinking about this too, with the, when I went back to Mercy Corps or I went down to see the chalk drawings, yes. people talk about this moment all the time. Can you explain a little bit about what that, what that was? So after, I think, oh my gosh, the first couple of weeks, it was such a whirlwind. I can barely even remember what happened this in what order. This is post-Oregonian story coming out? Yeah, it was okay. the week of... I think um, the story came out. Oh my God. Just thinking back, honestly, thinking back to those weeks right now, I'm just like, oh, it was. It was just. I was terrified before it came out. It's absolutely terrified. I didn't know, and journalism, they can't. I couldn't read it first. You know, oh, they're yeah. they're completely professional to do it. All. Yeah, yeah. I didn't see it first. Never read it. Before I had never read your it. whole life. I didn't story. watch the video before anybody else. I had no so idea. Nuts. You're like vulnerability <laughs> like, hangover. I, I mean, I'm like, here's everything. Here is my entire gut. I wrote this poem called Spilled Out, which um, I would read if it was if we had time. But I wrote this poem called Spilled Out about how you're just like, you, you're just open. And that's how I felt. Like, I, it's, here's everything. Everything's hanging out. You're Everything. just walking down Every, the street. Every, like, bit of anything. And, and they, 
they very thoughtfully asked these questions and I very thoughtfully answered them. And, and then, you know, I had no idea what the story was going to be, but there it was. And then after that, it was like, oh my gosh, like people are actually looking at me in the store and they don't even know what to do. Yeah. You know, and the checkout person at Trader Joe's, she was so thoughtful, but she just like her way of knowing what to do was like, she's, and I know she knew, I know I could tell, she didn't say she knew, but she, I'd talked to her many times. She just was like, can I get someone to help you with your with your with your groceries <laughs> and I'm like I'm, I'm good <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm good but thank you she was just like you're like that was uh, your moment I'll take the moment yeah thank you yeah. so much for offering she's like because it's dark out because yeah. it was yes. dark out yeah. yes can yeah, you get somebody to help you with your groceries people saw the vulnerability yeah. there yeah but that week with the, what happened with Mercy Corps is uh the employees there we're devastated by this. I mean, this, it's an awful story. People, I mean, what my dad did to me was horrible. It's graphic. It's long. It's involved. And multiple people knew. And then Mercy Corps knew. And his friends knew. And they abused their power. And they covered it up. And some of those people were still there. You know, it's, and, they, and these employees go into the humanitarian world wanting to help people. So they're very passionate about wanting to help people. So, and they drank the Kool-Aid of Mercy Corps and that, and believing that they're going to be doing good things and they do do good things, but that's like really important to, I think a lot of people as to who they feel like they are. Yeah. It draws a very specific kind of person. Yeah. And and what they, in their core being. Mm -hmm. Yes. So when all of that happened and came out, they were devastated about what have I been working for? Who have I been working for? And angry, hurt, um, like, I mean, confused. It was dark. I mean, I heard a lot of things about what the, it was like. But they also spoke up and they basically, like, it feels like I wasn't there, but what I hear the story is I, am, I can imagine it. I mean, they had like a stand up a stand up, um, meeting and everybody's all standing in there and they're all mad and people are crying. People are yelling they're angry and they're, they're angry at the CEO. They're like, what happened? What is, you know, what the heck? And and then the next day was a worldwide one. There's 5,500 employees around the world. They make over, wow. They've like millions of dollars. I think it's like $4.5 billion in expense. I don't know. Lots of stuff. Um, lots of money (laughs) and lots of influence. And, they were all upset. And at the end of that, that meeting, the people, the employees in the Portland office, which is the headquarters, were so mad that they went up to the fourth floor and they just all demanded him to, the Neil Kenny Geyer to resign. Just physically, together, went up there and were not gonna leave because they just were so upset by the lack of accountability. And so that week, Somebody from, from, her name is Shanti. I can't remember what her, her, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. I think I am. I don't know what her last name was, but she, and maybe with, along with some other people, went out and bought like a whole bunch of chalk and just went out to the courtyard, Ankeny Square, I think it is, Ankeny Plaza, outside of Mercy Corps. And there's a big plaza there. And they wrote, Tanya, we stand with you. We support you in giant letters. And the news cameras and everybody were down there. It was just a couple. So Neil had been forced out and then other people were retired, were, were resigning. And there was all this hoopla employees were rolling out of the building. And, you know, I was hearing about it and seeing it on the news and feeling like I'm just this person, I'm just trapped in my house and this is all about me and I'm all super vulnerable and everybody's looking at me and it's just like this weird thing, but I couldn't imagine that it was even real so weird to not have any support and suddenly have support actually feels really strange and discombobulating. Mm. But I wanted to go down there and um, see it and touch it because it couldn't be real. Otherwise, I just, my brain wasn't wired to believe it was possible. I mean, yeah, I couldn't understand it. So I went down there the following day, I decided purposely that I wasn't going to go in the night because I had always, if I'd ever tried to face that, it was in the night when no one was looking because I'd been afraid. You would drive by Mercy Corps at night. 
yeah, I was afraid of the building to the point where I wouldn't drive by. And, and then I went up and drive way out of my way to not even look at it. And then I touched it one day at Saturday Market. I like literally went up and touched it. And then I slowly like, you know, kind of got, but I went, I decided, I'm, no, I'm going in the day, in the daylight. I don't have to hide anymore. So I went down there and it's, just, it's a, it's, what ended up happening was, was employees came out that wanted to see me and I had said, fine, as long as there were no executives, because not that they're, they're probably fine, but I, I, some of them, but I wanted to know who it was I was meeting with. And then like a hundred people came out I, I, and, 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 and the main, I think the thing that was so impressive about it was they were so distraught and so upset, but they, they needed, they wanted to tell me that I mattered and what I said mattered and they supported me, but they also really needed something back from me and nobody knew what to do, but it was such a human moment yeah. of grief and I hugged almost every single one of them while they shared their pain. And I told them that it was okay a lot of the time. And, and that human that's reaction again, confusing, mm -hmm. but it was, a, it wasn't okay, but they were okay. Like yeah. they were, I valued what they were giving me mm -hmm. and I valued what they had done by standing up and sp using their voice so I could do that. And I didn't want them to feel guilt because it really wasn't their guilt. I would do it again. I totally do it again because that's who I am and what I would want to do. But it was really something that I don't think it's just, it's just, it's just something I'm thinking I'm going to process forever. Yeah. Trying to make them feel okay, but it's never going to be okay. And Thank you for showing up for me and supporting me. Yeah, thank you for thank you for 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 supporting me, and also the need that they had for me to hear them. At the same time, it was it, it was just like I mean, yeah. it's, I'm all I'm all stumbling around in my mouth about it because it was it was still it was still important. But later on, people said you just saved you saved Mercy Corps with it, and you know, and, and I, and that that was the hardest part. Doing it was tiring, but real. It was like real moments. Mm -hmm. But later on, hearing that was yeah. like I have to wrestle in my brain with what that means. Yeah. And am I okay with that? Is that who I want to be? And I am okay with with those people. They needed they did they did they were in the dark, and they needed to have some sort of like ability to believe there could be hope. And yeah. I like yeah. that. Yeah. Back to that building, you were abused in that building? In, not in that building, in their previous building, but it looked very similar. I knew the same people were in there, but yeah, in the, they had moved to that building. But you were abused in the Mercy Corps headquarters office? Yes. Tanya, yes. as we... As we start to think about wrapping up this conversation, because this is a huge topic and it's a really big story, but you say so much about the process of healing and the process of speaking. What would you, you also said you want to help give courage to other people or to make them feel like it's okay. What would you say to the world or to people about finding the courage to talk about this? Or what would you say just to somebody? You said you got hundreds and hundreds of letters. I think I want people to know people who are survivors, but also otherwise. I want to be vulnerable enough, open, honest enough to, for people to know that the truth about what this is like so that other people who struggle can, you know, can 
can know they're not alone, that mm-hmm. it's scary. I mean, there's I have a lot of anxiety yeah. to deal with it. I mean, flashbacks sometimes, why I couldn't touch the building. I mean, that building didn't look, it looks like the other building because they purposely tried to, you know, but even, even, even though it wasn't the same building, I still couldn't even go there. It was still, still it holds so much trauma. Um, all the things that you, you can struggle with, you know, health wise and all of those different things that I've struggled with nightmares and everything that, that doesn't, it does partly define you, but it doesn't make everything about you. I mean, it, I, I, people say those things don't define you. I think they say, they say that because they think that those things are bad. Yeah. It's not bad to have anxiety or nightmares because you've been raped countless numbers of times. It's not bad to have injuries mm-hmm. and to have things you have to struggle with. Um, you can have all of those things be true and you can work towards healing and they will get better. They can get better. But even the things that don't always get better doesn't mean that you can't also contribute or talk in this, like for myself, I, I mean, I can do this and I can speak out. I can do those things. But I also have to take really good care of myself. Yeah. You know, I have to, yes. I have to do all the things that I know now help me. Mm-hmm. And to, I think people expect that you have to be all together in order to, to be okay. Yeah. And that you can't speak out and talk about things that are important or that matter if you're not okay. Mm -hmm. So then no one's ever going to say anything. (laughs) Nobody's ever ever really going to be okay. No, no one is ever going to be okay. Like no one, even if you haven't had all of this stuff. It's true. But if you have all of this stuff, you're still, you're, you're, you're not. You're not going to be okay. You're not going to be okay. You're not going to be like it didn't happen. And for people to say, oh, you'll get over it or you'll get past it. You don't get past it. Just like you don't get past like growing up in New York or something like that. You just, you, you, it's, so you, true. it's part of who you are. Yeah. And then, yeah. but, but you can, but, but it doesn't make you bad or anything else. You have your full life. And I guess I want people to know that they have, that they're, that they matter and, um, that their healing is important and their voice matters. And that if you're a survivor, You get to choose how you want to live and how you want to heal. And you have every right to that. If you're not, that you're anybody, if you're a bystander, your voice matters. Mm. Any one of those people along the way could have helped me. Yeah. Um, And now all of a sudden there's people who stood up at Mercy Corps and it made a difference. Me saying all this stuff, going through all this stuff. I'm not a huge, big person, but... I spoke the truth and in my voice mattered. Yeah. yeah. Thank so. you so Tonya, thank you. much for being so real and so vulnerable and sharing your story with us thank and you. everyone out there. Yes. It matters. You are truly helping. It matters. You are. You're Thanks helping for people. listening. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.